Hello, welcome everybody. Um, we're actually going to go through today just a, a standard My Work Drive server setup. Before we get started on the actual setup, but we should just go through a little bit of the documentation about what you want to do in terms of getting a, a server up and running. So the first thing you're going to want to do is go to the My Work Drive site and then click on Support. And then if you actually click on the server guides here, um, the first one that's going to come up is the server setup guide. And so um, we'll be updating the video on here with the one that we're going to record today. And we're going to be going through version 5 of my work drive server. So there's some information here. It's important that you follow through and read this information and um, check the prerequisites before starting the setup. Um, but we'll just kind of quickly go through some things on here. So typically what you're looking for is to have a domain join uh, Windows 2012 R2 through 2016 server. You want to make sure it's fully patched because you don't want to be running Windows updates and other things in the background while you're trying to install my work drive. You want it to be, to be domain joined and you want to be logged on to that server when you run the setup as a domain admin with enough privileges and administrator rights on that on that server. Um, .NET 4.6 will be installed if it's needed um, automatically. Uh, for a standard setup, you'll want to have uh, four gigs of RAM and two virtual CPUs if it's a virtual machine is sort of a minimum. And then and for it to be able to access uh, and utilize our reverse proxy relays for the purposes of connecting to the server from the internet and for using Office 365 functionality, you want to make sure that these ports are open. If you're going to be using your own Office Online server or your own um, SSL certificate and host name, then that would not apply because you're just going to be having folks connect to your own infrastructure only. But a lot of folks do like to use our reverse proxy relay as a way of kicking the tires and testing out my work drive. So it's nice to be able to do that because then you don't have to spend time setting up a host name and SSL certificate, at least to do some basic testing of functionality. Um, you want to make sure that there's no antivirus running on the my work drive server itself. Um, you don't want that pointing to IS websites and slowing things down. Um, you'll want to open up port 443 once you're ready to host that server on the internet. And then, um, of course, the machine has to be a, a member of a Windows domain. But there's not going to be any files ever installed on the My Work Drive server typically. It's certainly for any enterprise environment, it's just a, a gateway to be able to get to the files that are on your backend storage on DFS or NAS volumes or Windows file servers. We don't support running my work drive on a server that already has small business server, exchange, other websites. Um, essentially what you want is a clean Windows server, fully patched, ready to go. That's when you're going to have the best experience with my work drive. Um, if you've got um, the shares that are located on DFS or you're going to be utilizing ADFS or SAML for single sign-on authentication, you'll want to jump to the setting up of delegation to allow the My Work Drive server to impersonate those users to get them over to those shares or through ADFS. So you'll want to click on that and set that up. Otherwise, if they're just going to be logging on through the um, you know, username, password, and forms-based authentication, you may not need that. And then we've got some additional um, instructions here around the client requirements. So um, the first step is that we're going to go ahead, now that we've got a server in my test environment here, it is uh, on a Windows domain, and I've already downloaded the media. In this case, you would be logging on to the My Work Drive site you can sign up for a free trial and get an account immediately once you log on go to download and then you'll see the latest versions here and I'm going to be going ahead and putting on uh, 5.1 and also please note that we also have a uh, Azure server ready to go and imaged up in, in the Azure um, 
portal up in Microsoft, and so that's it can be easily deployed as a standalone server that will install Active Directory on it as another way of sort of uh, testing out my word drive without even having to install a server in your own environment. And that's a very fast way to get things started also. So that's something you can check out up on uh, Azure as well. So I'm going to go ahead and run this setup. And um, as I mentioned earlier, we don't need to be installing anything ahead of time. So don't, don't need to go into IIS and install any of those components or anything. My work drive will take care of all of that. Okay, let's accept the license agreement here. It's going to check and see if port 80 is in use. If it's not in use, it's going to let you continue without any prompting. If it does see that port 80 is in use, it's going to give you an option to continue. Um, if this is a standalone new machine, and when it, of course it wouldn't be an issue. If you've got other websites on there, maybe you have one small little thing or something, then it might be appropriate. But typically it shouldn't find that it's, uh, port 80 is in use. We don't require that you expose port 80, but a lot of folks do like to have that because then users can be pointed to HTTP with your address, and then we turn on HTTP to HTTPS redirection. So that way, um, from an end user standpoint, they can just put in the host name and they'll automatically be redirected to HTTPS, and there'll be one less help desk request that'll be coming in. I'm gonna go ahead and pause this for a second while we, while we wait for this to continue and then we'll come back. Okay, so it looks like the server installation went well. I went ahead and clicked restart when it was done so that it's now fully installed. And so now we'll, we'll notice that on the desktop there's a My Work Drive control panel icon on here. If I can click, click on that control panel icon, I'll see the um, installation. I'll see that there's a test site I could go to here for the client side, and then the admin panel. And of course, I'm gonna wanna go to the admin panel first um, because I'm gonna need to at least create one share and decide what users are gonna be able to access my work drives. So we'll go ahead and just click on that site. Notice I have Chrome installed on this server. Um, that's our preferred browser. If you use Internet Explorer, of course, it's on a Windows server. It's all locked down, and you end up running into all kinds of viewing and sizing issues. So just avoid that. And so that's going to come up on a local site while we're waiting for that to get started. Um, we'll take a look at uh, a couple other things on here. You'll see an IAS, but we've got some sites loaded in there. So you can see there's, these are the sites that are ours. This is the site that the web client site is that users are going to be able to connect to. These are a couple of backend sites and the admin dashboard site. And uh, we'll get back into that later with some settings that we can adjust. So here we are. So we're ready to log in. Um, we're actually, notice it says enter username, domain administrator, and then password. So you want to be logging on to a machine that has admin rights on this machine and rights to any shares that you want to be able to add. I'm just putting in a, a domain admin just for simplicity. And so there's no databases that get installed. There's no separate username passwords to manage. That's a question that we get quite a bit on the setup. What do I use to log in? Well, you're logging in with Active Directory. You're already a member of Active Directory. The server is a member of Active Directory. So the first, I've already configured this server a little bit before, so we just did an upgrade. But I'm going to go through what you would normally get right off the bat would be um, the wizard, which will come up here. And the wizard will, because you don't have any share set up, we're going to just do a couple basic things to at least get one share configured. 
Typically, you don't want to be putting spaces in names and making and put all kinds of weird characters. Think of this as a standard Windows file shared. This is what's going to show up when users log in. So I'll call this share to, and I've already got a folder set up with permissions to users. But on a larger environment, this would typically be pointed to a network share, like you can see down here, backslash, backslash, server name, share name. Uh, and so you would just be putting that in there. Notice we import the existing users and groups. Now this is an important piece of information here because even though we use NTFS permissions underneath, you as an administrator can decide who you want to have the ability to see the share. If they don't have permissions, they might still see the share in my work drive, but they won't see any files underneath. They'll just see the fact that, yeah, you gave them a share called share, too, but they don't have any rights to it. So we can't give the user more rights than they already have in NTFS, nor would you want us to. So the only reason we're even providing these users and groups here is so that you can further limit who is able to access these files when they're out of the office. You don't necessarily always want everybody to be able to use my work drive just because they have the ability to get to some shares in the office. I'm going to go ahead and just leave these the same because in this case, it turns out that that's exactly what I want to do. Then the next thing we're going to do is decide, okay, we want to be able to get to the server from the internet and do some quick testing. So in this case, I have, uh, I'm using our relay to be able to do that. You have the optionally, you can skip the step and put in your own SSL certificate and IAS. Um, but we're going to, we went ahead and left this in there just for demonstration purposes. You're going to choose the relay that's closest to you and put in your email address and then the system will automatically let you know as soon as the site is live. And then as part of that same process, um, you would then have the ability to turn on Office 365 online editing, which again goes through the relay. We do have options for customers that want to use their own Office 365 online on-prem. There's a server called Office Online Server that you can install locally and you won't need to go through us at all. And then for very large customers, we have direct connection options where we can issue your own certificate even while you're still going to Office 365 uh, for at least a thousand users or more and you can contact sales about that for more information. Uh, we also allow you to automatically show users home drives so anything configured in Active Directory on the home drive tab as long as it's a UNC path will automatically show up and then a lot of customers uh, want to limit the file size. Um, if they're using this as a remote only solution, you might not want to have a bunch of, you know, depending on your internet connections, you might not want to allow certain file sizes. Maybe you just want them to be using office type documents. So you might, you know, put in like a 30 meg limit here or something like that. Then at that point you would click finish and then you will receive an email very quickly with um, that you're up and running and then um, we'll be able to then take a look at some settings here and see how things are going. So let's go ahead and just take a look at the shares that got created. So you can see we have shares here. I had some in there from before. If I go ahead here and take a look, I have the ability to edit these shares. I can add other users in here. Uh, we do have the ability to, to set up Windows search to be able to search and there's instructions on our site about that as part of that same setup document. If you're a really large enterprise, we also support DT search. And so you can search not just for names of files, but content within files. Um, so on, on a large server environment, we integrate with a third party called DT search, but locally you could use Windows search um, for anything under a terabyte or two. And so here we go, that we've got that set up. We can change the path, but once the share name is created, you, you want to leave that alone and you would have to create a new share if you want to change the name on that.
So not a whole lot to change there. Um, let's just take a look at settings. So um, if you're in a trial environment, what you're going to do is you're going to see that you're in trial mode for 30 days. Once you do purchase a key, you would paste it in here, and then you'll be able to see how many users have logged in all time within 30 days, um, what kind of license that you have. This is where you would go to take a look at that. And here you will also see um, the various... Um, pieces for the cloud web connector which is our relay for the site and the information there um, this one isn't completely up yet so it's still showing us unavailable we can refresh that and take a look at that office online 365 is using that same relay mechanism and you can see your information is available there but you don't have to have one you don't have to have cloud web connector enabled in order to use the office online editing um, or vice versa, so that's not required. And as I mentioned earlier, we do have the ability to do use an Office Online local server rather than using uh, Office Online editing uh, up in the cloud. So if you wanted to point to your own server, that's an option as well. We now also have an option that's new, which is Office Local Web Edit. And what that does is it provides the ability to be able to log in to the web client and then edit a document in local office directly um, through the web client. So that's a really nice feature. Um, you also have the ability to um, decide if users are um, allowed to save password on that. Because the ability to open up a document within the browser in local office will now create a link back to that and show it up in your recent documents, the user will get prompted to re-enter their username and password if their session has lapsed. So there are times where customers don't want to allow them to save their password uh, depending on their single sign-on options or you know compliance requirements. So um, that checkbox is important there, but you can uh, actually support recent file lists and it'll just go right back to the server, even though they're not even in the browser yet, they'll just get prompted as needed to be able to log on. Office Online um, versus local versus download, so double clicking in the browser client, we would uh, double click um, by default is to open it online and then uh, open locally or download. So let's just take a look at our site here and just see if we're up and running. I'm just going to go to the local test site here so I don't even have to worry about anything. So you can see this is what the users would see. So then it's just a matter of how do we want to have the users be able to get to this. I'm going to log in. And so I'll see the web client site. We also, of course, have a map drive site, and we also have mobile site. Um, you'll see here that I've enabled two-factor authentication. I'm just demoing that at the moment, but we'll show how that's integrated in a second here. So we have all the options here. I'm going to go ahead and approve that on my phone, and now I'm in. So here's the shares that we had set up. I was a member of one of those groups that it was allowed access, so I'm now able to see those. And so you can see here I have the ability to edit documents online. If I double click on that, that'll open the browser and then have to give the user ability to edit online as well as co-edit. I also have the option of clicking edit, which will which will prompt me for the local version of Office to be able to do that. And so that feature can be turned off and on. So you can see that we're fully operational here. Um, then, the course, the, the next question is, well, how do I get my users to be able to access that? And so as I mentioned earlier, we've got the cloud connector. So let's go back to that. So 
so once that is up, it would be qadg.myworkdrive.net, for example. I actually, on this server, went ahead and already installed an SSL certificate, and we can have a direct, so we could have a direct connection. And, but in a quick test environment, you can use the cloud connector instead. So if you take a look here in the web client side, and I look at bindings here, you can see that I've we've already got certificates installed and here they here are the s is where you would bind that so then you would just bind that to the be the specific host name and then you'll be able to connect to it so the first thing we did prior to doing that would be installing the ssl certificate so if you go back to that setup document you'll see that there's information on there about pointing to you to that and that's exactly what we've done we've kind of gone through we've set up the shares we've imported the users there's some important notes about the security around that so again we're, we're using NTFS permissions um, as a security precaution we can only provide access to files that, and permissions that they already have and there's more information here about that we've tested the local access over port 8357 um, and then um, port 80 so that's all working then it's just a matter of how do we want to connect to that we can connect to it either using our relay or you can publish your own SSL certificate and then open up firewall ports to port 443 and access it that way as well so there's more information here on that we also have a support guide here on you know how to bind your certificate but it's a standard IS website, so it's literally just put 443 on, on there. One thing I will note is that we do get requests where some folks have, you know, are having trouble getting the Office Online stuff working or the Cloud Connector working. A lot of times what we'll see is they have removed 4357. That should never be removed if you want to be able to utilize our Relay because that's part of that service. So, um, there's some troubleshooting um, tips on that. We have actually have a support doc right on our support site around that if you do have issues and otherwise just contact us and we're pretty adept at getting that done quickly. And if you're in a secure environment and you need to lock things down, we also provide you a, a link here to a tool and a lockdown guide to be able to turn off unneeded SSL ciphers um, to just to minimize the exposure to your IES website. So the next part was just getting into Office 365 online and we've kind of gone through that. We've gone through the, the web edit, the ability to edit in local office and let's now just kind of go back and look at a few more settings here. So as I mentioned earlier, require SSL, a lot of people aren't really sure what that means. So what that does is it actually redirects port 80 um, to port 443. So a lot of folks have done this for years with like an Office 365 installation, I mean with um, Outlook where they would make it available and then when a user types in the wrong URL it just redirect them and that's exactly what we're doing here so when we make this change we can also make port 80 available to users but when they go to it or anybody goes to the port 80 site it'll just automatically redirect them to 443 to the secure site and that just eliminates confusion from a user stand and user standpoint we also have the ability to require usernames to be entered in an email format. So there's a lot of companies that have Office 365 and are allowing users to log in with their email address. They've got their Active Directory set up with a UPN suffix to match. And so to avoid confusion and not have to have users log in um, and ask questions around that, then that's an option here with my work drive to have them put in their email address rather than just the username. Either we don't require the NetBIOS domain name, it'll just assume the current domain so you, users can just otherwise just enter their username and that's all they need. Same thing that they would use when they log on to their computer. 
The next option is around the map drive client. We allow um, that to be turned off or on in some secure environments. They don't want to be able to have users be able to use that, although we do support two-factor security around that. There is an option to disable password saving in that client, and then we also have some abilities to either whitelist or blacklist file types. So that's a really nice feature in order to be able to prevent users from opening up things that don't make sense over the map drive. The map drive is really intended for um, office type files, uh, PDFs, things of that nature. You shouldn't be running uh, PST files across it, databases, executables, um, large movie files. It's really meant for day-to-day -day getting to files, editing files, and saving them back to the server. So if you want, you can block that. And also from a security standpoint, it's nice to be able to block those types of files. Not only does it block them from being executed and downloaded, but it blocks them from putting those files onto the My Work Drive um, server um, onto your shares as well. And then for really strict environments, it can be locked down to only allow just Office documents. We do require TMP because that is an extension that Office uses when they're locking files in terms of renaming and uh, saving files back. So that you do want to leave that one on there if you do go ahead and use that. Note that if by enabling this feature, if you've got some older map drive clients out there, they'll need to upgrade to at least 5.0 to be able to connect to your server using this version uh, when you put on these restrictions. If you're not ready for that, you can just leave it on no restrictions. We have a mobile client that's also available. Um, that, that is can be turned off or on, but we also have a scale down web file manager client for mobile devices as well. And so some companies have opted to just lock everything down to a browser, including remote on a mobile device. And on something like an iPad, we even support Office 365 editing in the browser on there as well through our mobile browser client. So you may not even need the mobile client in that case. WebDAV is a protocol that if you need third-party support to be able to do some things that, and connect to your file shares with an, another type of app, then that is something that you can leave on, but it, it is not required. We do not require WebDAV. It's just optional. You can turn that off. And from a security standpoint, typically when companies are using Duo two-factor or locking things down to ADFS or single sign-on and SAML, they would typically would turn off WebDAV. OneDrive sharing is just the ability to be able to take files and share them externally, and that is done based on, depending on whether or not you've enabled data leak prevention, will determine whether or not that shows up on a particular share. However, um, you can completely disable OneDrive sharing if you like oh, globally here, as well as Outlook sharing. And when we say Outlook sharing, we're talking about Outlook web access through Office 365. And so that can be uh, turned off or on here. Again, it ties into data leak prevention. So these are just global settings. You can also do that individually on shares. If you have only one share that you might want to allow folks to be able to get to everything and another one where you don't want them downloading or external sharing at all, um, you would do that at the share level. You don't need to do that globally for everybody. Here is search. And so the default is to use Windows search. If you want to enable that, there's instructions on our setup document for that. Basically, you're installing Windows Search Service on the, both of my work drive server as well as any backend Windows file servers. And then the, that share is then available for search as long as you're indexing those file shares. We also then have the option here to change over to DT Search, which is our third party company that we support. And so you would it, typically, in that case, you would be setting up a standalone search server that does all the indexing for all of your shares, and then you're pointing My Work Drive server to that. You're not doing the searching on the My Work Drive server. That's a very intensive pro process. Companies that do that, you know, have 
you know, potentially tens of terabytes of data. And so they need to have the appropriate amount of infrastructure and horsepower to be able to run that. Here you can change the company name that will show up on the login page on the web client, the default language. You can make a decision here as to whether or not you want to include users' home directories. And um, you can also limit people logging onto my work drive based on whether or not um, they have at least one share set up. So for companies that don't want to allow users to log in, that's a way to limit access. If you've got home drive set up and you want to show them for folks, you can have that on, but you can limit people logging on to my work drive that they need at least one other share in order to be able to log on. So that's a way to limit people who can log on. If you just want to, if you want to allow everybody that has a home drive in your organization to be able to log on, regardless of whether or not they're part of one of the group shares that you created, you would that box would just be left unchecked. Um, maximum file size, we kind of talked about that earlier. For companies with multiple domains, you have the ability to be able to change the search order so when users are logging in, um, that will determine how quickly they log in in terms of being searched through ten, potentially tens of thousands of users in multiple domains in the same forest. Email domain website lookup. So that's really important because we also support in Office 365, when you've got Office 365 online editing enabled, for users to be able to use mobile Office apps such as Word, PowerPoint, and Excel on their mobile devices, you will see if you open up Word on your phone that there's an Add a Place option and My Work Drive is listed there. If you add My Work Drive as a place and then go to log in as a user, if you don't have this filled in, then it's going to prompt you for the URL for your site. But if you do have this filled in, then the user will only need to put in their email address and password. So for example, if my email domain is acme.com and I put in my site here, uh, and this when we call you know qadg my work folders.net, then this portion here won't be prompted by the user to be required. So then literally they just put in their username. It already based on this knows to go look it up their URL based on their domain and then they would just get prompted for a password. So it does save some confusion and typing on the end user side of things and it's highly recommended to enable that if you're going to be supporting mobile office, uh, Microsoft Office on mobile apps. When instructed by us, you can enable debug logging. Um, typically, you're going to be just looking at errors only, and even if you did turn on debug logging, if we were assisting you in support, you would turn it off when you're done because you wouldn't want um, that kind of verbose logging filling up the local drives with um, unnecessary information. So that's where you would set that. Session timeout is when you log on to public versus private computer options when you're going into this web client here that that is what gets set here and then these these defaults here actually match what you will see in office 365 and then we also have some um, search query and zip file download timeouts here so that if users are trying to download some really large files or doing inappropriate types of searches that are too global, then we're not going to bring the server um, to its knees while it's trying to return results that don't make sense. So you can adjust those um, to whatever is appropriate for your environment, depending on the amount of horsepower your servers have. Okay, so that's pretty much it for standard settings. And we're going to now just take a look at some of the settings over here for enterprise. You can see that we have multiple options here for single sign-on. Um, we have the option of setting up ADFS. If I put in the URL of the server for internally, it'll actually look up um, the thumbprint for you.
and you can see here that's already been pulled in. There's an extensive guide on setting that up. There's a lot more to this. We have that in our support article. You have to set up the relationship in ADFS. You've got to set up uh, the delegation properly. So, But this part is just simply putting in the host name of your ADFS server. Your My Work Drive server needs to be using a public SSL certificate and host name to be able to connect to it and you need to make sure there's no firewall issues between your ADFS server and your My Work Drive server. It does not work through the relays, and that's pretty much the case on any of these single sign-on enterprise type of options. The relay for connecting to your site is really for testing or very small businesses that just have small amounts of files that they want to have users to be able to access. So again, there's a separate manual for that, for ADFS, that you'll find on our support site. And then for Azure AD, we've got the ability there to have you set up Azure AD um, integration. Typically what we're seeing that people are doing is, rather than running ADFS, a lot of companies are taking and running Azure AD sync to their local Active Directory. They're having users log in to their Office 365 with their email addresses on their domain. And of course, those email addresses match the UPN suffixes on their Active Directory. And so within um, Azure AD, when you add an enterprise app, you'll see My Work Drive is listed there as a published app. On, and so you can very easily add that. There's instructions on the Microsoft side as well as on our site. And it's literally about a five minute job when now that we've got this link here where you're once you've created the app over in Azure AD you copy and paste the metadata URL here as long as you follow our instructions and the users are given the proper permissions and delegation for the My Work Drive server then at that point you've then got that app and you can promote that app and put it on users right on Office 365 for users to be able to click and it'll be all single sign-on. We also provide, the ver in this version, we also s support manually configuring SAML, which would be done with configuration files. So if, if your provider for single sign-on is not covered here, you'll be able to do that manually. And we again, we provide instructions in our, in our support site around that. Although I can tell you uh, OneLog and, and Okta are coming on board shortly, and so we, we will have uh, most of the main ones set up with this very easy to use, just paste in the URL option here. So that's a whole separate video on each one of those that we will be doing that we can show you um, on those, and there's separate documents on those. Uh, require SSO login in browsers, so that's an important uh, piece of security for a lot of companies where they don't want users logging in directly to My Work Drive. They want to lock them down and make them use single sign-on so that they can't put in username and password to log in. Um, so in that case, once you once this is enabled, then that does have some, you know, um, then if anyone types in the URL of the My Work Drive server manually, they'll be redirected to ADFS or their SAML provider and then be prompted to authenticate there and then be taken back to the My Work Drive site in order to be able to see their information. So um, if your company does not want users to be able to get to the My Work Drive site, um, directly and log in with username and password, then you would enable this feature here. Uh, My Work Drive is also listed under Duo as an app. So if you go to My Work Drive, or you go to Duo and set up an account over there, you will see that when you go to add an app, My Work Drive is listed there. We, that is also very easy to set up. Oh, our app, our two-factor authentication works on both the web clients and the both of the web clients for both mobile as well as desktop as well as the desktop applications for Mac and PC and for the mobile clients and literally all you're doing is entering these three values here enabling two-factor authentication as I mentioned 
you can also then turn off other features if you don't want like web dev that would be a good time to turn that off and so that's uh, we have a separate setup document on that but it's really quite simple if you want to be able to limit who can log on to my work drive um, you can do that within duo as well who's going to be prompted um, for two-factor authentication you can set policies over there data leak prevention is a feature that's we've spent quite a bit of time working on and added quite a bit of features to that. Um, some of the things that are available in that, if I enable that, what will end up happening then is on each share, you will have the ability to turn off and on, the ability for users to be able to download documents or only be able to view them online. And so um, we also can globally prevent downloads on all shares, or we can globally allow Office 365 online editing on specific shares. And then we can also put in our own custom watermarks across documents that we're locking down. So when users are accessing a file in the web client, they will not be able to print it without having a watermark go across it. Also their information, the username and the date they viewed it will be um, spotted right across the screen on that. So one, now that I've enabled that, now when I go back to shares, um, we, we have the ability now to decide um, by that share what do we want to do. So in this case, this share is allowing download, but notice Office Online Editing is not. So we could completely lock this down. If I don't allow downloading and I don't allow Office Online Editing, what will end up happening is when I'm in the web client here, if I double click on any of these documents, we also have a third party viewer that supports 60 plus file types. It'll open up in our viewer instead and it'll have that watermark across that document. So that is a setup step that you'll want to follow on that. Um, so in this case, this one would be completely locked down. But if I go to my other, maybe on this case, I have this share locked down because it's a very critical share. But on a different one, I may have different settings. So this one may be, I allow everything. So it's a normal share. But then once I enable that data leak prevention, I do need to go back and decide how I want to handle that. And so what typically companies are doing is they're, they're parsing out various settings for various shares. But we do provide the ability to globally block across all shares, or you can do it by group. So, and then again, if you wanted to be able to say, well, how do I keep people out of a specific share? Um, you would do that based on the groups that are allowed access to that share. So you could you could repeat putting the share as many times as you want with different settings. So if you had, maybe you want um, for domain users, you you can you can go in and say, well, they're allowed to download. Um, you know, they're, or they're not allowed to download, they're not allowed to use Office Edit, but I could put in a specific user and say, yes, but this user can do that. So you can mix and match various users and groups within a share and decide how you want to handle uh, data leak prevention for them. And then they'll be given access to that information. Um, and then depending on the setting, we'll then determine when they double click here and the options here for sharing data via OneDrive or Outlook or downloading will be removed for the any time that that's turned off um, in data leak prevention. So you can play with that and we have a separate document on data leak prevention on our support site that gives more details with a video on that as well. And we'd also support a thing called previous versions. There is a support article on that and it's linked we actually that if you we do support a thing called um, volume shadow copy snapshots a lot of companies use that to create like hourly snapshots of their file servers that is part of a windows operating system we support being able to access those previous versions within the web client so users could be permitted the ability to right mouse click here and there'll be a previous versions option that will show up on here. And so that's what that is for.
So you do need to install a separate service on the server for that, as well as any back-end file servers, in order for us to be able to access those previous versions, and you would enable that here. We also support extensive branding options here. You can see you can change the powered by URL, your help page, um, where it's linking to download the latest map drive client if you want to substitute your own pages for that. You can also change uh, menu bars across the top and toolbars uh, for all the web client as well as your logo. And then finally looking at logs, we've done some work over here to log all actions taken by users. So if users read a file, log in, log off, delete. Um, if I go through here, I can set various dates. I can also look for specific actions. So for in this case, let's say I wanted to see anybody who's read a file. If I just type that, it'll limit that. And then of course I can export all this information to a CSV file. And this information is all located under C WAN path, WAN path data logs folder in an XML format. So it can be exported or synced to any logging servers that you want in order to be able to do extensive crunching of information. That completes the basic setup and all the options for setting up the My Work Drive server. Thank you so much for your time.